BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello, I'm Matthew Price and this is Beyond Today from BBC Radio 4. Every weekday we ask one big question about one big story in the news. Today, where is Dubai's missing princess? Picture Dubai. What do you think of? Palm trees? Sparkling seas? Beaches? That holiday you're saving up for? That's how it's sold to us, isn't it? But every now and then there's a story that shows us another side to Dubai. It's one of the seven kingdoms that make up the United Arab Emirates. Now, the most recent of those stories was Matthew Hedges, a British academic held in solitary confinement in the UAE, accused of spying. And then there's the story we've got today, the story of a woman called Latifa. She had her 33rd birthday this week, but we don't know whether she celebrated it, we don't know where she is, and we don't even know if she is alive. Latifa is one of the daughters of the ruler of Dubai, and earlier this year, a video of her was posted online. And if you are watching this video, it's not such a good thing. Either I'm dead or I'm in a very, very, very bad situation. So where do I begin? That video was filmed in a flat in Dubai, the home of the woman who's going to tell us Latifa's full story. She's from Finland. She's got platinum blonde hair. And despite everything she's been through, she still somehow manages to smile. Her name is Tina Yahyainen. Tell us about Latifa then. What's she like? Um, well, Latifa is my best friend. Um, she's extremely uh, down to earth, very kind. She has a big heart. She's also um, very adventurous and a person who, when she decides on something, she doesn't give up until, you know, she does whatever she's decided to do. You know, I've seen that um, when she started new hobbies. When I was her capoeira teacher, she was training seven days a week, um, two hours a day, regardless of her being tired or for for any other reason, she, she never cancelled. So she was obviously um, very determined to, to learn. How did you first meet her? Um, she contacted me um, end of 2010 um, through um, my website where I was advertising Kapora classes. Um, so she contacted me by email asking for private classes and she wanted a female teacher. I didn't know who she was. Um, it's only, it's only uh, yeah, I only found out who she was when I went to the uh, family-owned uh, horse riding stables to meet her. <laughs> okay. And obviously I had to pass security <laughs> checks and everything and I was like, Oh, who, I wonder who I'm going to meet now. Who was she? Um, it, I, I couldn't ask her, obviously, directly on the first time meeting her if if her father was who I thought he was. Um, I just knew that she was part of the um, Al Maktoum family, which is obviously the ruling family in, in Dubai. One of the richest families on the planet. Exactly, yes. Can you remember that first meeting? She was dressed in, in a very sort of um, casual way. Um, she hadn't like done her hair or like she, she looked like very down to earth person already. in the first meeting, she was very kind. Um, she asked me if there was any way that I could fit those classes um, in my uh, busy schedule. She said, I can, I can do the classes at four o'clock in the morning or I can do at eight o'clock in the evening, whatever suits you. Like, <laughs> she, she really she wanted you to yes, teach her. She didn't give me a uh, um, possibility to refuse. How quickly did she become a friend? Um, I think it took quite a few months. Um, initially, we started seeing each other outside the classes um, after she started inviting me to um, small gatherings. Um, they were usually uh, vegan cooking evenings classes. She would bring um, someone to teach at the, the, the stables. Is she a vegan? Yes, okay. as if I was a vegan. And also the, the group of friends um, seemed to be mostly uh, expatriates, like her previous teachers of of some kind. 
And I was actually quite surprised not to see any local females. And what sort of gatherings were they? They usually ended up being quite fun. And she would always um, end the evening by giving us um, huge fruit baskets to take home that she would order from the kitchen or, or something to bring bring back home. She was always very generous and, and very thoughtful in that way. And at this point, did you think she was happy? Like from the beginning, I thought she was quite introverted. Like when I started giving her classes, um, she was avoiding eye contact and and she was quite shy, I have to say. So it was hard to, to really know at that point if if she was happy. Why were you in the UAE? Why were you in that part of the world? Um, well, I had moved to UAE in 2001 um, to work in the tourism industry. And later on, I moved to um, real estate. And what was the attraction? Well, I think same like for anyone else. You know, it's the sun and and sand and, you know, the kind of easy lifestyle, really. But that's until you really get to know what the real Dubai is like. Latifa always had to have a chaperone with her. So that's why we used to meet at one of those uh, family-owned premises. But it was a lot more complicated to, to meet outside of any of these locations. We would have to organize it and have um, a, a like family-approved uh, chaperone with us. But it was only later on I realized that it's just to control her, really, to know who she's with, um, what she's doing. Um, she also had the designated driver, so she wasn't allowed to go on anyone else's car or anyone's uh, private homes. Um, she also had curfews. But during the first years, I, I, I didn't really understand the restrictions because Latifa was never complaining about her life. She couldn't open up enough to, to say that she was unhappy. We started skydiving together um, end of 2013 and I think that brought us closer as well as friends because when you go skydiving with someone you really have to trust that person because it's yeah it's after all it's it's quite a dangerous sport. It was like capoeira was um, for Latifa when I first met her it was a distraction from her miserable life. She finally told me everything in 2016. Um, I remember being in a, in, a, in a cafe with her and she said, I want to tell you something. And she started by showing me an article about her sister Shamsa. Um, it was a Guardian article from 2001. And she told me that um, Shamsa had escaped while um, on a holiday in the UK at an... Um, the father's estate in Surrey and um, she was caught and she was kidnapped and brought back to UAE and as a result she spent um, eight years in prison. So in 2002 when Latif was 16 years old um, she basically escaped. She thought um, she can get outside from UAE and get some help for her sister Shamsa and in the worst case scenario if she was caught she could then be united with her sister. She tried to escape, that was 2002. That was her first escape attempt. So she was caught at the border of Oman. She was um, brought back to Dubai and she was put into prison um, where she spent about three and a half years. Three and a half years? Yes, she told me everything about it in, in detail and it was obviously very hard for her to even talk about it. Um, she told me about the treatment, um, the, the, um, the beatings, um, solitary confinement. Um, she was sleeping on a broken mattress. She was not given anything to even wash herself. And many times they, um, they came to uh, beat her up so badly that she had to crawl to the bathroom. Um, so when she told me about all this in 2016, um, I just burst into tears 
um, I thought it was so sad. And I felt like if I had known that, I would have understood her so much better over the years, especially those times that I used to to, to go with her for her her therapy sessions and and when I saw her looking really sad. But because I didn't know, I, I, I don't know. Afterwards, I, I felt terrible. Why do you think she chose to tell you all this? Um, I think because those days um, we were spending so much time. Um, I saw her every single day and she could finally fully trust me. Did she then have a plan of what she wanted to do? Um, well, that um, actually came across only in 2017. Um, we had lost a good friend in a, in a skydiving accident that spring, and Latifa was very depressed about it. She told me that I feel like, you know, life is so precious and um, we, we only live once. And basically she um, told me that she has been communicating with a person who is outside UAE who had uh, written a book uh, called Escape from Dubai. And she wanted me to travel and meet with that person to discuss um, Latifa's possible escape plan. So she basically asked me uh, if I would help her. Were you nervous about doing that? No, I was excited because I thought, <laughs> you know, every time I, I went traveling, I felt guilty leaving her there. Um, so I thought, wow, finally, we're going to have this amazing adventure together. Finally, we're going to be traveling together and we can do whatever we want to. It was only after I had met with um, Hervé Jobert. Only after that did I realize that it was actually quite a risky operation for all of us. Because Hervé is, was a French secret service agent, is that right? Exactly. The, the final plan was to meet early in the morning in Dubai, um, drive to uh, Oman, the capital of Oman, Muscat, then go by dinghy to international waters, uh, about 15 miles off the coast of, of Oman, um, where um, Hervé and his uh, one of his crew members would meet us um, on jet skis and take us to the boat. And then we would sail um, all the way to India, then fly from there to US, where Latifa was supposed to apply for political asylum. On that morning, I met with her um, just to not to make the um, driver suspicious. We had met for quite some time, like early hours for breakfast in different locations. So there was nothing unusual that that day when we finally decided to leave. Latifa um, left behind her abaya, which is the, the black local dress. She changed her appearance a little bit and she, she jumped in my car and we drove to Oman. During the, the journey, um, well, first of all, it was Latifa's first time sitting on the front seat in the car. How she, old is she at this point? Uh, 32. She was um, talking about all these things she wants to do. She was like, this is the first day of my life. <laughs> you know, like, you know, she was like almost like a child, like so excited. We went to the beach and we, we had a dinghy waiting. And both of us had just um, tiny backpacks with us. Um, the sea was very rough. There was actually um, like a warning for a storm. But we thought, okay, we've come this far. There's no way we're going back. Um, so we were in this small dinghy in uh, nearly two meter waves. Um, and it was equally hard while we were on jet skis. We've, we fell off about four times before we reached the boat. And um, I would say the total time was closer to eight hours that it took us to get to Nostromo, which is the name of the yacht. We were exhausted, but we were happy. It's like we had finally made it. We were um, about uh, 30 miles 
um, of Goa. After how many days? After eight days. Eight days of uh, sailing. And um, two days prior, we had realized, obviously, Hervé, the captain, had told us that um, he was thinking that we are either being followed or it's... It can't be a coincidence that we have um, search and rescue planes circling above us and there was a boat about um, six to eight miles behind us um, following us. So there were suspicions that people were coming? At that that point we were um, getting more and more nervous. Tell us about that night. Um, so on the 9th of uh, 4th of March, um, regardless of our suspicions that we were followed and and the situation was getting obviously more tensed, um, we went down to our cabin and I remember just having brushed my teeth when we started hearing these sounds from the upper deck. It sounded like uh, gunshots, loud noises, um, so we locked each other's um, what ourselves to um, the bathroom of the cabin and we're just hugging each other and Latifah's oh my god Tina they come after us um, we're very very scared um, Latifa um, contacted um, detained in Dubai and sending like an emergency message that I, I can hear gunshots I think somebody's boarded the, the yacht um, and then the inter- internet so the satellite connection was gone um, so we had no way of contacting anyone. Um, and soon after, uh, the cabin uh, started filling with smoke. So we were forced to leave and, and go to the upper deck. And we were, you know, holding each other's hands. And I went first. And on top of the stairs, we were met by um, um, Indian special forces. So there was men in uh, commando outfits. Um, there was multiple machine guns with laser sights uh, pointing at us and one of the men um, grabbed my arm and pushed me to the floor and I realized I was lying in a pond of blood. So of course I was worried. I was thinking, uh, you know, something must have happened to one of the crew members already or maybe it's a maybe he's already dead. Um, I, at that point, I was very, very scared. I didn't see where Latif was taken. Soon after, um, two of the men uh, grabbed me to the outer deck and were basically uh, pushing me um, towards the railing and pushing my head towards the, the water. And they were telling me to take my last breath and they were going to uh, shoot my brain out. That's That's what they told me. So I remember thinking, oh, this is it, you know, like, um, after some time, um, I was taken to the, um, the front deck of the boat where I saw Latifa lying on the floor with her, uh, hands tied behind her back as well. And, uh, she was screaming and kicking. Um, she was repeatedly saying that she's claiming for political asylum and and these Indian men kept on telling her, you know, be quiet or we'll shoot you, you know, but Latif didn't listen. Um, they pushed me to the floor and they told me to um, close my eyes or again, they were threatening to shoot me. And Latif was defending me. She was saying like, leave my friend alone. She was, and at that time I thought, wow, she she's so brave because I felt paralyzed. Like I can't, I can't even speak at at that point. Um, soon after, I, I heard a person uh, speaking Arabic, um, talking to Latifa, and Latifa kept on repeating in English. And uh, then I heard her saying that, you know, rather rather shoot me here than take me back to UAE. And that's that's those are the last words of Latifa that I heard. I was told by um, one of the Emiratis who had entered the boat. Um, he said that, do you, have, do you understand what you have done? You have stabbed the ruler of, of Dubai in the back by helping, helping his, his daughter escape. 
And he said that um, if you want to do yourself a favor, uh, I'm not going to stop you if you will uh, jump off the boat now, obviously with my uh, hands tied. Um, I remember thinking, um, if he's already telling me this, what's what's happening next? They told us that they are taking us to UAE, uh, where we're going to be punished for what we had done. Um, around three days later, we we arrived in UAE. I'm not sure where, because upon arrival, we were blindfolded and handcuffed. I was there for about two weeks. So then Daily Mail had had broken the news and it became an international news. And what happened at the end of the three weeks? Well, basically, they um, released me, um, which I found very surprising because... Initially, I was told that I was going to be getting a life in prison or a death penalty for what I had done. Um, so when suddenly everything changed and I was told that um, I will be given a second chance in life and I will be released, um, I, was, I was very, very surprised. When you think of Latifa now, how do you imagine her at this moment? Well, she can't be in 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 a very good place. Um, I would imagine her being somewhere detained, detained, and Latifa is a rebel, so she wouldn't she wouldn't be quiet. They would they would have to silence her. Yesterday was her thirty third birthday, and I remember um, a year ago on her birthday, she didn't want to do anything. She said, "I don't want to celebrate my birthday." I want my next birthday to be when I'm when I'm free. Um, so yesterday I was I was feeling quite quite sad, um, but I thought at least one of her dreams is is coming true, which is um, her story, which is going to be heard by and seen by so many people. In some way, I've also felt like I've you know failed. Um, helping her um, but that's why I'm, I'm, I'm still here I'm not planning to give up So where is Dubai's missing princess? Well, her father's office sent the BBC a statement saying that Sheikha Latifa and her sister Shamsa are adored and cherished by their family and Latifa, the statement says is now safe in Dubai Thank you, Tina, for telling us your story and Latifa's story. There's so much more that we couldn't fit into this episode, but there is a gripping doc directed by Jane McMullen on BBC iPlayer. Search Escape from Dubai. Today's producers were Lucy Hancock and Jarja Mohammed. Andy Mills mixed it for us. John Shields is our editor. And thank you for your comments on the podcast. We're still getting some really thoughtful responses to Tina's blackfishing episode, which have kept the team talking about it all week. Do continue to get in touch. Hashtag beyond today. Also email us now beyond.today at bbc.co.uk. And please do subscribe to us on BBC Sounds. There is loads of good stuff there. Thanks for listening. See you. Hi, I'm Monty. Sorry for interrupting your podcast. Just give me a minute. I've got something I think you'll really love. It's called Life Lessons. This is a podcast from BBC Radio 4. It's going to be full of the issues that are important now. And we'll hear about them from people who really know what they're talking about. Because these issues are at the centre of their lives. We'll be hearing about period poverty from campaigner Amica George. Questioning the food we eat from farmer Kate Moore the Brexit divide from vlogger Jazza John and many, many more. Young UK talk about the issues that matter most to them. They're living it so we can learn from it. Subscribe to the Life Lessons podcast. Discover it now in BBC Sounds.